Hey, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to session module four, I believe this is, of the, um, the course. In this module, we will be looking at gender, youth employment, and social inclusion, um, and how it relates to the broader issues around uh, gender equality and women's empowerment. Um, so this is, uh, uh, you know, module four, as I said. And first of all, I'd like to congratulate you for completing module three. Um, and this week, we, we are reconciling the worlds of work and care. And we'll look in, in more detail at the relationship between these two in today's session. Um, this module was developed uh, in collaboration with the uh, UN Women. Um, and there are two contact people there for UN Women. You may also contact myself, Medjabin Alarakia. Uh, and my email address is also medjabin.alarakia at unwomen.org. Um, so here we have uh, now looking at the, the, the module, um, we will look at uh, this, this discussing the importance of care economy, particularly after COVID-19, and how it addresses the increase in unpaid care and domestic work. Um, you know, over the, over the period of the COVID, uh, oh, sorry, over the period of the pandemic, we saw a lot of uh, visibility and awareness uh, being raised around the unpaid care work burdens as sort of the, the work sphere moved into the home sphere. Um, but in reality, women's lives are constantly like that. This just became more apparent um, during the COVID period because everybody was working from home. But a lot of times you see women uh, trying to balance between the two uh, quite a bit. So the course also emphasizes another significant determinant of women's participation in the labor force, which is the availability of public care services and child care. So the second aspect of this is then what do we do in terms of trying to help women balance between the care needs that they need to provide as well as the economic needs that they have. Um, and then um, and finally, we will touch on the fact that whether if we're not able to reconcile these two issues between uh, the sphere of work and care, uh, it would be very hard for us to get to um, the gender equality globally. So by the end of the session, we hope that you will have learned how the balance between and, and the relationship between uh, economic opportunities um, and economic participation, as well as the, the care um, needs and how we can come together and look at the intersection between compensation and decent work conditions. Um, for particularly young women, but also women more broadly, and hopefully also men in the future. But right now the issue is more pertaining to women than to men. Um, so I'm not going to go through all of this, um, but these are some of the key issues that we will discuss and we will talk about them along the way. Um, a lot of these, um, well, we, we may not be able to get into a lot of depth on all of these in this particular session, but um, the course notes that you have cover all of this in quite a lot of depth. And as well as the further reading list can um, also further elaborate on particular examples and issues if you have uh, more of an interest. So um, according to UN Women, um, care is an indispensable, indispensable component of human well-being. Um, so this is, this is a, a primary thing to remember and, and, and to really to emphasize that care is needed by everyone um, almost all the time. And it's not always, um, you know, uh, care for someone sick or uh, care for someone old, uh, but it's also, it covers everything from cooking and cleaning and, um, you know, just taking care of the house um, all the way through to the more demanding needs, such as, you know, taking care of a sick or elderly person or childcare. So in that sense, each one of you has care needs and each one of you are providing some care uh, services and are also receiving some. And we want to really emphasize here that it is a, a crucial part of a productive economy. So in order for someone to be able to go to work full time um, in, in the world, there also needs to be at the same time somebody who is providing support to make sure that you know the laundry is done or the kids are taken care of so that that person can go to work from nine to five. Sometimes it requires them leaving home at seven in the morning and they come back at nine at night. So that that is just a piece of that same uh, balance where you need some you need people to go to work full time, but for them to be able to go to work full time, you need to be able to have somebody else or some other way of providing the care services. So it is 
Broadly, care refers to the provisioning of goods and services necessary for physical, social, and emotional needs of dependent groups such as children, elderly, ill people, as well as those with disabilities, in addition to regular people that we're talking about who may not have any of these particular issues, but also need to be able to go to work and, and do other things. Now, the final point here is that the imbalanced gender distribution in unpaid work um, is one of the systematic sources of inequalities uh, in economic outcomes by gender, along with class and origin. And we'll talk more about this as we go through the course, um, but, but you will start to see why this is more of a, an issue affecting women. But overall, what ends up happening is the result we see is the gender inequalities as a, re as a result of the uh, care needs. So there are official definitions of work, uh, paid, unpaid care, et cetera. So we'll just quickly go through those so we're all on the same page. Um, work means the activity that requires conscious expenditure of time and energy. So anything that you have to do is work. Um, and then we have uh, usually the uh, system of national accounts uh, defines work as anything that could, one could theoretically pay someone to do. Um, and so this is in the system of national accounts, not the general definition, but the system of national accounts, which is anything you can um, outsource or pay someone to do. So you can pay someone to cook for you, but you cannot pay someone to bathe for you or to sleep for you. Those things have to be done by you as an individual. So this is how they differentiate between work that you can pay someone to do and work that you cannot. Now, unpaid uh, means that the person is doing the activity but not getting paid for it. So this is when you have um, oh, perhaps uh, the wife at home and she's cooking, but she's not getting paid for this. So that would be unpaid. But if you had a, a domestic worker in the house who was cooking for the household and getting paid, then that would go into work. So this is where the, the difference starts to come in, where you have the paid work or the unpaid work. Um, then we have care. Now, care is the activity that serves people and their well-being, both personal care and care related, such as cooking, cleaning, washing clothes, etc. Um, and here it so it is, a, it is a broad definition, and we'll get into it in the next couple of slides where we look at direct care and indirect care. But essentially, at this point, it's about just the personal care and care-related activities, where which we define as care. Now, domestic means that it does not place in the market, but takes place primarily in the household. And here, we also will, will want to make the point to say that a lot of the care needs in our societies currently happen in the household. Um, so the household is the primary sort of unit for care services and care provision, um, but it, it, is not, uh, it is not always seen as part of the world of work or, or valued in other ways. And again, we'll get into some of these as we go through the next uh, slides. So um, the background on uh, unpaid work evolved through the 90s and onwards where there was more and more uh, global discussion on gender and development and what it means. Um, and then there was uh, a lot of recognition of unremunerated work uh, burden facing most women in developing countries, but also in developed countries now. Uh, we come to recognize this as well. And involves um, tasks such as fetching and carrying water and uh, fuel wood and other things. Um, the concept of unpaid work expanded from reproductive labor and domestic work uh, into more conceptual uh, an encompassing terminology of care work, care, care labor, and care economy since the 90s. So we've, we've, uh, it has evolved quite a bit since then, um, but, uh, but this is the, the sort of um, general evolution of this. Again, a lot of this is documented in the notes that you have. Um, in terms of the importance of unpaid work, so as I said, unpaid work is the basis on which the rest of the economy is built. It is the sort of subsidizing the labor force because it allows workers to go to work uh, and have the services provided in the background to be, enable them to go to work. It is also the development of the next labor force. So when mothers are at home nurturing their children um, or fathers are at home nurturing children, it is the household's investment into the future labor force. So there is also an economic aspect to it. Um, then the, the next thing we want to highlight here is that unpaid care and domestic work sometimes is very rewarding. Um, you know, it's, it's very, very rewarding to take care of your children. It is very rewarding to play with children. Uh, some people find it rewarding to cook. Some people find it rewarding to clean. So some people find it very rewarding. Um, and different aspects of it are rewarding. And as we said before, necessary for social and, and other ties. 
Um, but some unpaid care work is drudgery. So it's very hard and time consuming. Um, for example, washing clothes or cleaning diapers. Um, you know, so it's it's very difficult. It's not it's not necessarily pleasurable. It's uh, stuff you have to do for survival. And in some cases, we do have technology to deal with it. In others, we don't. Um, so that's, there's, there's two aspects to it, which we have to keep in mind. That we're not saying that we're eliminating it. We're saying that some of it is rewarding and some of it is very difficult. So unpaid care and domestic work is socially necessary to do. As I said, preparing people for income generating activities during the day, raising children, which is producing future labor force. Um, the importance of unpaid work as an economic and social policy issue is further acknowledged in various sort of UN documentation, UN policies, and there are many UN agencies that are discussing this in different aspects, um, because we need to look at what this, what the contributions of this are more broadly in terms of uh, the economy as well as social life, and then to learn to value it and to figure out a way to value it, because it's very common and often we hear people say, oh, you know, what does she do? And, and, and a very common phrase is, oh, she's just a housewife or she's just at home. But that is a full day's worth of work and that, that is valuable work that we can see. Um, you know, so, so we need to look at how we start to value it, not just in terms of financially rewarding it, but socially valuing also that contribution. Um, so the tools, we have several tools that are available for measuring and valuing unpaid care work. Um, and one of the main ones here is, uh, you know, looking at the time use surveys. Now, time use surveys are, are done by, by, by country national bureaus of statistics. I think in Africa, there are about 13 or 14 countries that have done it. Um, and uh, it's usually done at the five or 10 year interval. However, now it's trying, we're trying more and more to integrate it into the labor force surveys so that the data could still be collected even more um, regularly. So we see how things, uh, how, how time is spent over the years. Um, so the time use surveys gives you uh, a breakdown of how time is spent by the population. And we can then see how much time is spent on childcare, how much time is spent on cooking, on other domestic chores, on elderly care. And we can also see it uh, um, disaggregated by men and women. So in that case, it is a very useful tool to help us see who is doing what and how much time it's taking away. But we can also then use that as a, a way to quantify value the work in terms of contribution to GDP, because there, there are simple sort of uh, processes for doing this. But for example, in the example I gave earlier, where we're talking about uh, cooking needs, um, you know, if you were to say, if you were to pay a domestic worker an hour uh, whatever her pay would be for an hour for the cooking that she does in one hour over the, the day or week, whatever it is, but we can quantify it to the hour. Um, then you could say that, okay, so all the housewives who are at home who are unpaid and are doing the same task are contributing this much value to the GDP. And we could then, you know, extrapolate it to see what is the, the contribution to GDP that is often hidden. Um, then, um, yeah, I think I've covered everything that's on there. Um, then we look at the different types of work. Um, so now we're going into a bit more of the, the definitions compared to what we looked at before. So unpaid care has, has different bits. And again, there's a really nice uh, diagram in the notes around this. But we say if we look at direct care and indirect care. And then there's paid care. Now, direct care is the stuff that you have to do for somebody else. And this could be uh, bathing or feeding a baby or a, an ill person, helping with the child's homework, um, you know, somebody it's, it's supporting someone through an emotionally difficult time. This is all um, direct care. Sometimes it is direct care that is uh, needs skills and training, but a lot of times it also is things that don't need skill and training. Um, but when it is, skills and training, it is often quite expensive. Um, there's direct active care and then there's direct supervisory care. And again, these are just to help you understand how much thought and, uh, and reflection has gone into this as well. So in terms of direct active care, that would be you know, what you do face to face, um, helping the person, um, usually looking at you know, child care or something like this, whereas the supervisory care, where you don't need to actually do anything, but you're just sort of watching them and just being there. And this is particularly for slightly older children, but not old enough to be left alone yet, 
but not so young that they they may hurt themselves or something. So you can have a six or seven year old who you need to be around, but don't need to actually be, you know, paying attention to all the time. Now in this, I think there's there's uh, also a component that we need to look at um, that we don't always have a way to quantify it um, because, you know, like the example that's here, you could have a bedtime story that could be two minutes or it could be 30 minutes. Um, so there is that in terms of direct care, but it's not always quantified equally. Uh, sorry, it, it's not always the same amount of time that we need every day for it. But at the same time, there are um, other values in that that we can't quantify in that direct care piece. You know, the, the social bond or the, the emotional connection that you have with the child when you're reading the bedtime story is something that you wouldn't always be able to quantify. Um, in the indirect care, um, here we're looking at unpaid labor services where the input that are inputs into direct care. Um, so it does not always inter in, fact, in fact involve personal interactions, but it could be meals, laundry. Sometimes it could also be if you're looking at an institutional setup um, like a child care center, it could also be the administrators um, or the cleaners who are part of that. So it's not directly care, but it's indirect care services uh, or contributing to the care service. And then paid care holistically is a driver of economic growth and it's been seen as a transformation of unpaid care domestic work into the paid work. Um, and again, this can be seen in the national uh, accounts, but here we're talking specifically about institutionalized or other kinds of paid care work, which could include household domestic workers, it could include teachers, it could include nurses, um, it could include a, a range of uh, care service providers that are available in the market, informal or formal, but that are that are there and provide care services. Um, in terms of the care economy and its functions, so we said already that it's an important part of human activity. Uh, it, it reflects, it interacts with the rest of the economy, um, and therefore care makes a vital contribution to both the economic and social sustainability of our society as it is. Now, the purple economy looks at how um, you know we can look at an economic order organized around sustainability of caring uh, labor through distributive internalization of cost of care. So here, what we're talking about is if we were to be able to provide care services in a way that um, were to support the household to reduce the time burdens that the women or sometimes men, but the, uh, the time burden that household care providers have by providing um, government supported or private sector or you know, support, other support services to the household to reduce the burden. And here we could have multiple different uh, approaches where we could look at universal social care infrastructure, uh, which looks at, for example, child care or elderly care. Um, and here we would be redistributing, looking at the lighter purple square there, uh, it would be redistributing the care costs between the public and domestic spheres because currently most of that care cost is borne by the household. Uh, we could look at labor market regulation. And in this case, we're looking at how employers recognize also the care needs of employees. Um, so it could be whether we have more flexible working hours, whether we have um, uh, more provisions for uh, childcare and sick days, or uh, you know somehow having family leave to take care of a sick, one, sick person at home. Um, or you know, having some flexibility for employees, employees to go for a parent-teacher meeting or something along those lines. Again, this one looks really at redistributing the care costs between men and women, because what tends to happen is the men tend to go to work full-time and the women tend to be left with the childcare uh, issues. And so if there is a parent-teacher conference, for example, it's the mother who will go more likely than the father which means that she's the one who has to take the, the time off from work to go. And that has then implications on the employer's impression of who are good employees and who are not good employees. The, the third piece is looking at ecologically sound physical infrastructure for rural communities. And here, again, this looks at redistributing between public and domestic sphere. But here we're looking at physical infrastructure. So whether we're looking at water systems or, or lighting systems or fuel energy, because again, those are a lot of things that women end up doing and as, as spending investing a lot of their time in, um, whereas the, the, the physical infrastructure if provided by the government would reduce the, the time, for example, spent by a woman to fetch water. 
Um, and then finally, we have the enabling macroeconomic environment. Again, this looks at how we invest um, at the national level, at the macroeconomic level, um, to enable an, the reduction and redistribution of unpaid care and domestic work. Um, the unpaid care and the care economy lies at the core of the gender aware economics. Um, and this is because of two things. One is that the gender patterns of time allocation um, which is possibly the most limited economic resource, uh, constitutes a fundamental source of gender economic gaps. And here, as I've been saying, um, you know, women, given that they have and bear the burden of uh, unpaid care needs, um, oftentimes are not able to use their time for, for economic activities. And this is what we're referring to here as a limited economic resource. The second is that the care economy and the health production are essential elements of human well-being. Um, and therefore um, need to be valued in that sense. So sound economic analysis is possible only through framework that recognizes close interactions between non-market and market spheres of consumption. Um, and so this means that when we have any kind of um, quantification of growth and particularly GDP, um, GDP does not value in any way the social interactions or the value of having a mother with a child at home. The GDP only looks at the labor force participation and it looks at you know uh, how many people are working and therefore what is the profit that we see. So there are problems in the way that we currently analyze and value eco economic growth um, that are missing out these key components of our life that are very important. So, um, the, the, so again, this is a little bit of a recap, but we have direct and indirect care work, as I said before, um, the definitions we've talked about already. Um, and, and the one thing I want to highlight here is that we say that care work, um, it goes beyond unpaid work to also include volunteering. So in, in the current way that the system of national accounts is set up, volunteering is not counted, but sometimes you'll volunteer at a um, a wedding, a funeral, um, you know, you'll be there to support uh, some, some a friend of yours in, in something which also falls under unpaid work, but then strictly volunteering is also part of unpaid work. Um, so a significant part of care work in all societies takes place in family, kinship, and friendship. We talked about this. A lower, large portion of unpaid care work remains outside the boundaries of economic uh, measurement. Also, we talked about this. And care work is provided through paid labor in the market um, can, all, can, can be quantified. So this one also we've talked about. Um, now this one is a good, uh, a good diagram for you to take a look at, and you can look at it also in the notes later on. Um, but here we look at, you know, it's a categorization of the different types of work um, and different groups that need it. Um, so we have direct care, indirect care, and, you know, for example, breastfeeding, um, is, is a, a direct care that can't really be uh, quantified. Um, the family daycare and babysitting is, is direct care, and oftentimes in the informal market, then we get the paid employment. So you can look across this to, to get an example of the different types of care services that they are. When we look at unpaid work and the labor force, um, there has been no substantial progress towards achieving gender equality in the world of work. Um, and this has been seen very clearly in the ILO publication um, that was launched in 2019. Um, and unpaid care work, uh, unpaid work is economically important, but it, in, it prohibits women from entering the labor force. And here, particularly as we've talked, when women have to spend time taking care of children, or fetching water, doing the laundry and cooking, then they aren't able to engage in labor force activities that are for immediate financial gain. Um, given that much of the work takes place in the household, the lack of policies, policy interventions at the care economy serves as a systematic source of gender inequalities. And what we are saying here is that we would like to see more sort of uh, gender aware policies that look at um, the care economy. And if you look at some of the European countries um, and, and also Canada, for example, there are some really good policies in place that support um, and balance and try to balance between unpaid care work that women have to bear the burden of, but trying to change this uh, distribution of it, but also looking at ways to reduce it. Um, so I think the, the, the last point is about unpaid care work is, is an issue of inclusive growth uh, and human capital, human development, not only through its 
relation to gender equality, but because it is important for poverty alleviation, human capital enhancement, enhancement productivity, jobs, unemployment, uh, and you know, sustainable growth overall. So it, it is a fundamental piece that we often don't look at. Now, SDG 5 promotes gender equality, and under target 5.4, we have the 3R strategy, which is reduce, recognize, reduce, and redistribute unpaid care uh, and call for actions on unpaid care work policies, uh, unpaid care work and its policies. Um, in the agreed conclusions of the Commission for Status of Women, uh, CSW 58, the strategy called for actions to go beyond merely increasing the visibility as a policy issue to actually looking at ways where we can redistribute and, and look at things in a more balanced manner. So there are a number of policy interventions um, that are identified. And as I was saying, there are examples in different countries where, where work-life balance, rural physical infrastructure policies can be brought in to, um, to change this balance and to reduce the care burden. Um, and they, even according to both UN Women, ILO and others, um, the care policies, macroeconomic social protection, labor and migration policies, all of these come together uh, to provide a conducive policy environment on decent care work, enabling uh, the recognition, redistribution, and where necessary, reduction of unpaid care work, as well as promoting the representation and, and, and decent work for care workers. Now, this last point is important to note, because when we look at SDG 5.4, we are only talking, talking about three R's, which was, as you know, established in 2015. Since then, again, the, the, the work and the discourse has evolved, and we now have this other piece uh, of the representation and decent work, and in this case, we're talking about remuneration of care workers. So now, what we talk about now is the five R strategy as opposed to the three R strategy, which includes also um, the rights of care workers, um, usually in the formal, uh, sorry, usually in the paid work sector, not always informal. Um, so here, when we're looking at the international conventions, there are several international conventions that look at uh, how we need to, that recognize unpaid care work and then look at the, the, the issues and that we have to address them in some way or the other. Um, and so the 19th International Conference on Labor Statisticians, um, which was in 2013, made a decision to, to adopt the inclusion of unpaid care and household production in the system of national accounts. However, it's a recommendation, so not many countries are implementing the provisions yet. Um, the CEDAW, which is the UN, United Nations Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, also promotes gender equality, uh, but its recognition is limited to childcare and, and it's linked to formal employment. Now again, CEDAW was, was written in 1995, I think. Um, so it's, it's also been dated, and, and as we talked about in the very beginning, the discourse around this issue has evolved quite a bit uh, since some of these older um, uh, you know, conventions were, were put into place. There are other frameworks, um, which uh, is, includes the agreed conclusions of the Commission for the Status of Women, the SDG goals, the Beijing Declaration for and Platform of Action of 95, and the others that are listed here. Um, and so despite, you know, there's been some momentum around this globally, um, there are no, no they, they are not yet binding agreements around the issue of unpaid care and domestic work. And at the same time, there is, so everything that is done is more done on a voluntary basis or when governments and partners recognize the need for it. So even though it's not binding, there have been some countries that have done some, some good work as well. So, um, so there is a, a difference, uh, there is some movement, but there is still needs to be some more that needs to happen. So um, recognizing unpaid care and uh, unpaid and care work at the national level may take a number of forms. Uh, there may be national level legislation. Um, there may be inclusion of pay unpaid in the national statistics, um, as we talked about with the ILO conventions. Um, there's the valuation of unpaid care work and exploring its linkages through, through labor force participation rate of GDP and others. And then there's a compensation of unpaid work through social transfers. And this is often done either through payment of childcare or elder care wages, or, or sometimes they're called uh, child care benefits um, and social security coverage. But there's also uh, some of the recognitions around um, universal, uh, universal health care, um, sorry, universal pensions, for example, that are also cover women who may not have been in the labor force before, 
um, but still are eligible for the universal old age pension because it also recognizes some of uh, the contributions of the women to the economy without actually being part of the labor force. So here we have um, a, a case study on the policy example of investment in social care infrastructure. And the Kidogo centers are, um, it's a social enterprise that is very, um, it's a bit of an innovative approach in what they are doing, um, where they're looking at supporting women to start up um, early child care centers. Uh, in some cases, they're called crash. In some cases, they're, you know, daycare centers, but it's usually for the children that are under the age of formal education. So not at the age of kindergarten yet or first grade. And here they're looking at um, mompreneurs is what they call them. They're women uh, entrepreneurs who they provide um, training and some equipment on in terms of how to have a, a quality child care center. And they set up a micro business in the local community. Um, and this is a way to provide child care services for, in, in the case of Kidogo, they started with um, urban slums in, uh, in Kenya where they, were, where they were doing this work. Um, and they're looking at models of being able to provide child care where the state cannot provide child care, but child care is needed. Um, and some, style, some sort of a quality child care center. Um, the, the women are then provided with the skills and some equipment. Um, and some mentoring so that they're able to provide quality childcare. Um, and and they're, they're, it is a good model to look at how this could be done in a socially responsible way, um, but meeting the needs of both the entrepreneurs as well as the mothers who need the childcare uh, services. So the, the, this is a list of uh, further reading. There's a few different things there that you can look at. And if you Google, you'll also be able to find a lot more. Um, so this is the, the assignment for this module. Um, so using the knowledge gained from module four, uh, the SWOT analysis model before, write an essay on reconciling uh, the worlds of work and care in favor of women and youth. So, you know, why would this be uh, important or, or why, why is it beneficial or needed? Um, looking at the different aspects in the SWOT analysis. Um, and then the two documents there are the UN Women Training Manual as well as the SWOT analysis template. The UN Women Training Manual is, uh, I think it's about 150 pages long. So give yourself enough time to go through it. Um, but it does have a lot of content in it that you should be able to use. And I understand you only need to write a one page essay. So um, it shouldn't be so hard to do, I think, in the end. Um, and I think uh, that is it. And then here there is the, the group discussion as well, where I, it, the, it's, it's actually a very useful exercise to look at the policy gaps in your own organization that constitute barriers to access uh, to economic opportunities and employment for women and youth, and, and look at how you would um, address those gaps in your organization. And here, I think this, you know, you could just as uh, some of the pointers, you could look at the, um, uh, employment policies, you can look at the working hours, you can look at work-life balance, you can look at maternity and paternity leave, um, you could look at uh, how training is provided, um, what is the travel policies, so there's a lot of different things that you could look at um, in this, and, and uh, I think it would be quite interesting uh, for that self-reflection as well. So I think this is the end of my talk on module four. Um, good luck with all your readings. Um, and I believe we will meet each other uh, in the session uh, later on. And we and I will be happy to address any of the questions that you may have. Um, there's a lot of content on this and uh, I, I, I don't think I did justice to all of it, but I think the lecture notes are very good and the UN Women Training Manual also has uh, a lot of information in it as well. So thank you very much uh, and I will stop here. <laughs>